Okay, I think we should get underway. As, as I mentioned earlier, we have a very packed schedule today. So, um, welcome back. Uh, in a moment, I am going to introduce the speakers that are here with us for this panel session. This panel session where we are going to ask, can standards answer your innovation challenge? Judging from the voting before the break, most of you feel that they are part of the answer, not the whole answer. So we'll also explore, as well as that question, if they are part of the answer, how do you make the most of them? But before we do that, let's go over and have a little look at what Mariella's been up to uh, and see what's on our scribing wall. So, standards helping us to build a better future. That was a core message right at the beginning. And what are they about? They are about understanding what good looks like. Um, great competitive advantage. Uh, we talked quite a lot, a lot of mention of the international context uh, in which we're having this discussion. Also, some of the key issues that need to be addressed. The secret ingredient, Christian's presentation, Europe must act faster to keep the leadership in creating and setting standards, um, but it is quite challenging. People feel it's difficult, a feeling you might miss the moment. Uh, so that crucial question of when in the innovation cycle do standards have a role to play? Thank you for that, Mariella. We'll keep watching uh, what you're up to, but let me introduce our panel now. Um, I am delighted to welcome Patrice Lefeu, who is Executive Director in charge of EU institutions for France, Luxembourg and the Maghreb country at Ernst & Young. And Ernst & Young works with a lot of entrepreneurs addressing many of these issues. So Patrice has a very broad view of the role of standards uh, and the challenges therein. Next to him, Volker Stick, who is Managing Director of the Institute for Industrial Management, RWTH Aachen University. He, if you like, comes from the idea generation phase, the basic research phase. Torsten Polset, Director of Fraunhofer Mutz, an institute which specializes in internationalization processes and, among other things, the transfer of knowledge from science to the economy, and that word bridge in the title of today's session. Uh, he specializes in being and helping people to take advantage of that bridge. Next to him, Christine Alliot, who is Vice President for Innovation at the global energy company Total Marketing and Services. So, industry moving from that basic uh, and replied research to the products, the acceleration phase, uh, if you like. Next to her, Thomas Michel, who is president of WSSTP, the European Technology Platform for Water, which promotes coordination and collaboration in research and innovation. Again, this acceleration phase, market access, really cru crucial issue. And last but not least, uh, Gudrun Ranvaldotje, I hope I pronounced it Sort of okay, so I know. Icelandic is a nightmare, but she tells me everyone knows her as Gudrun. Uh, so we, panel, it's all first names from now, so I don't have to repeat that again for her sake as well as mine. Uh, Gudrun is Vice President Te Technical of SEN and Chair of the SEN Technical Board, so the standards world itself. As I mentioned before, um, I've asked our panelists not to make any opening remarks. We're not going to have any presentations in this session. I'm just going to ask them a few questions uh, to get us started, uh, and then I will come out uh, to all of you. Uh, I would like, what I'm going to try and do today, we're talking about standards as a bridge to innovation. I like to act as a bridge between them and you. And as I say, we are looking for your comments as well as your questions, your ideas, if there are issues that you uh, feel, barriers that you would like us to address, issues that you want to raise. So please do feel free to do uh, raise both. And at some point, I'll be going over to Ben Carlin, uh, who is still monitoring, monitoring Twitter. If you prefer to answer your, ask your questions that way, please do feel free uh, to do so. So let us dive in. Uh, it is great to have you all here. Um, Patrice, can I start with you? Um, just so we get some sort of groundwork laid, as it were. We had a very inspirational start here, but what for you do you see as the role of standards in a general sense, um, and how important do you believe they are for innovation? Would you echo what we heard from Scott and Christian earlier? 
Yeah, uh, this is true. I mean, Scott and, and Christian's input were very, very interesting because, I mean, it was, first of all, they were very complementary because we got, let's say, an input from, let's say, the operator, you know, in UK and somebody, you know, who is from the market. And it's, it was absolutely interesting to see how, I mean, these two inputs were converging, you know, uh, in the same direction. So just as very few, let's say, introduction, what I would say is uh, standards to me means, let's say, a triple strategy, you know. First of all, we can say that uh, standards, it's, let's say, a defensive, you know, strategy. Defensive, why? If you are, let's say, a consumer, a consumer if you are a citizen, you know, or if you, if you are a company and dealing in B2B business, I would say you need to have protection, you know. You need to have protection because when you are buying a good, you know, when you are buying a product, when you are buying a service, you know, you need to be sure that, I would say, first of all, what you are buying is compliant, you know, with, let's say, the regulation and the rules. You need to be sure that, let's say, the quality will be good enough and you will not have, let's say, uh, some, uh, as, as Christian mentioned, some disappointment, you know. And, and, and last but not least, I would say you need to be sure in terms of safety, safety or in, if, even in terms of environment, you know, this, uh, these products will be f fully compliant, you know, with, let's say, what the, regu uh, the regulation and uh, let's say what the citizen would I would say would like to buy. So to me, it's it's really an issue of protection. The second the second issue is really let's say offensive strategy. You know, as Christian said, you know, uh, as a market player point of view, it it's absolutely necessary. There is no question mark about that. You know, it's absolutely necessary. You know, to have this kind of weapon. You know, if you want to let's say to be aggressive on the market and if you want to bring as f as quick as possible you know your your product on the market because as we know as we know now time to market and your capacity to turn your innovation into a products and to make business you know on this market it's absolutely related to let's say the competitive advantage that you can get you know on this market and standards according to this magical triangle that Chris, Christian mentioned you know during his presentation are absolutely crucial and last but not least, that's uh, the last point is, let's say, it's a, co a collective strategy. It's not only, uh, let's say, uh, 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 let's say industry or even citizen or even regulator or even operators at, let's such uh, like Sen or Senelec, uh, but it's a collective adventure, you know. Uh, when Christian was mentioning, you know, when, for example, as a global company was considering, you know, to bring at the very early stage, his product, you know, to, let's say, the U.S. market, to the Chinese market, and to the, the, the domestic market in Europe, it's, we do not have to be naive, you know. We need to have, let's say, member states, let's say, the regulator helping, you know, to, let's say, to have fair rules, fair game, you know, on this market, which is not necessarily gender, of course. It's not just, you know, uh, something to play. So, to me, this collective action should be played, you know, by, let's say, the full value chain, you know, meaning resource center, and we go back, you know, to the, to, to the topic today, how we can bridge innovation and, 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 and um, I would say business development through standardization, and it makes sense that at labs level, you know, and, uh, and, and when you are a company and you want to develop new products, at early stage, you know, as a sort of pre-standardization process, you know, you, are, you will develop, you know, your products according to what are the rules uh, which you will, you will have to respect if you want to access to the market. Okay, thank so. you. So it is both defensive, offensive, and if you like, a level playing field, a, a guarantee. So it plays all those roles. Uh, and you talk there, you of course, they're looking at the whole of the value chain, as you say. Uh, we have with us uh, those different stages in the innovation cycle because we want to get a sense going to what Patrice said and what Christian talked about earlier when he talked about getting in early, echoed there by Patrice, the different stages in the innovation cycle and how our panelists feel standards can play a role at that different those different stages so uh, Folke if I could turn to you Folke and Torsten as I mentioned more from the sort of the incub the generation the incubation phase if I can put it that way um, how important do you think standards are um, and would you echo what you've heard so far I think um, let's start with a small thinking where we are today um, I'm absolutely with you. I've been working in the industry for a long time and I was not pretty much in contact with patents nor with standards. Now I'm a representative for a research organization and what I feel I think is that just let's think over. We heard from Scott this morning that we are moving from craftsmanship to mass production and what's now on? It's knowledge society. Now we are in the midst of the knowledge society. Some of you might have 
heard about the contractive cycles, which is saying, okay, our society, our economics are strongly relying on knowledge. And then I will put a question that I can't ans uh, uh, answer myself, but how to share this knowledge. Sharing knowledge is done for sure through standardization. That's what we have heard several times. Uh, sharing knowledge is the key issue of driving performance of companies. But if we are really in the midst of a knowledge society right now, we know that a lot of this knowledge can't be patented like we, I'm an engineer, <laughs> like we have learned it during our uh, education. So a lot of this knowledge that we have to share today must be open. It must be used for sharing with markets, but it couldn't be patented. So we need new approaches to my mind. The innovation cycle has changed evidently. And if the innovation in former times was reaching up to a product, it's now reaching up to new knowledge. And sharing this new knowledge could give us the chance to evitate spent resources and to focus on creativeness. Okay, thank you very much, Torsten. From your perspective, so that, that new context in which we are working, uh, we heard earlier standards began 100 years ago, uh, but there's now a new imperative. They have a new issue to address. Um, how do you see their role? Well, first of all, I would say that uh, we have heard a lot of uh, the importance of standards for large companies. Yeah? Mm. And I like to make that twist that um, the impression, it, it might come to the impression that actually it's not so important for mid-sized companies or SMEs. So it's a huge question, do they really get, can they also get innovation out of the creation of standards? Yeah? And I'm happy to tell you actually that we conducted a study which also looks at the world of smaller businesses mm -hmm. and we found many, many channels through which actually uh, the innovation can be implemented, innovation potentials can be generated really by engaging in the creation of standards and by the existence of standards itself. So it may be, to add to the views we had so far, it may be a very important element, especially seen from the European perspective. I mean, we have, a, in many countries, we have an economy which is characterized by mid-sized firms and small firms. So how do we take them along? We don't necessarily have only large companies, as, as you observe it more in Asia. So what we found is that we found many, many different examples, exciting, exciting examples, how these small firms actually profit from being engaged in the creation of standards and from the existence of standards through inspiration, through communication, through the absorption of knowledge, through even thinking and discovering completely new business models, uh, which is a particularly exciting field. Also through the, uh, uh, through the attempt to really exceed, exceed uh, standards and so different, many different kinds of innovation impulses. And so what we see is that they are often not aware of this. Mm. So, so there's a question in how do we get that across so that really communities become more engaged in this. And indeed it's a challenge and even moreover to really bind that up. I mean, we are, as Europe, we are 28 countries in the EU. So we have to have mechanisms really to go in the same way. And standards, the creation of standards on national and certainly European levels are very important element in developing the economy. Thank you. I'd like to come back to, to those issues uh, in the discussion. And you're talking there, uh, we heard from a big company at the beginning, Christine, you obviously coming from a very big company, uh, Total, and for you, Standard Central. How do you see the role? Would you agree with Christian when he described them earlier as absolutely core uh, to a company strategy? First of all, I have to tell you that my job is to help my colleagues to innovate. So I need standards for my job to help people to innovate. I'm not, I'm sure, I'm not sure that I'm totally clear, but we are speaking about standards for generating a lot of innovation, but we need also standards to define the methods yeah. for innovation. I'm not sure I'm clear. So, for example, um, as my job is to help people to innovate, I have to prove that I have a real job. 
<laughs> like human resources is a real job. It was not 30 years ago, but now it is recognized as a real job. So if you need to have a real job, you need standards. Okay. And process. And when you say defining the methods, so the focus there really is for helping those working in research areas in your company and innovating to know uh, the common methods of, of, of working, of yeah. measuring, uh, of, of that's as crucial yeah. as the standard for the product that they are producing. Is yes. that yes? You put uh, the the process of innovation, ID generation, incubation, industry acceleration. Yeah. You need to have process regarding workshop, work and methods to help people to go quickly through this process. Thank you. Um, Thomas, uh, a perspective, I mentioned you, the, the water European technology platform, a perspective of you and particularly in the context, so we keep grounding this uh, in the real world, in reality, of, of the impact of standards in the water sector in particular. Uh, well, professionally, I am myself at the ideation. I yeah. work in the ideation phase, where the rules of standards for me is a recognized and accepted framework. Okay. I work on the amaturation, applying research into the market, applying research. Mm. There, I think standards are guidance and benchmarking. And finally, I work also with the market uptake, with the acceleration process, which I do represent as WSTP today here. And there, standards mean speed, okay? Speed to the market. Uh, I would like to challenge the audience by introducing uh, another nexus. Uh, everybody talks about nexuses, so I see a nexus between innovation, market, and standards where innovation represents the future, market represents reality, and standards represent maturity. And this nexus is retrofitting itself continuously. So I'm here representing the water market, and very, very briefly, the water market, as most of you probably know, is highly fragmented and highly, highly, very highly regulated. So we are very, very much familiar with mm. standards, guidelines, rules, regulations, etc., etc. But all of these guidelines, rules, and standards are of regional or national level. Okay? It is essential for the water markets and many other markets to grow, to compete, and to innovate in a global world that we get one EU water market and that we have EU-wide standards quickly. Okay, so question, how do we get there? But we'll come back to that in the discussion. Gudrun, we've heard there from various different phases of the innovation cycle, how they see the opportunities, but also the challenge. Uh, your perspective in terms of, um, and I want to come back a little bit on this question, uh, if they're the secret ingredient or the weapon uh, that Patrice talked about at the beginning. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, it's all right, it will, yes. they will pick you up when they realize okay. which mic, there we are. Thank you, yes, uh, this is, this is uh, uh, absolutely right. Uh, and I would like to uh, uh, confirm that uh, and uh, also remind you that, uh, as Christine rightly said, it's not only about standardizing your product, it's also about using already existing standards to help your business. And I think this is something that also needs, to, this might be the secret. This might be one of the, the, the big secrets of standardization. Uh, but we also need to uh, consider that uh, what, what uh, Scott said, uh, standards are uh, not only about what good looks like, standards are a consensus mm. of uh, what, good, what good looks like. So standards creation uh, is about the creation and sharing of knowledge. And we see, we saw from uh, what Christian explained to us, what uh, what lack of standards, and also what you said, what lack of standards can uh, uh, can mean. We have a fragmented market, a highly regulated and a very fragmented market. This is uh, uh, these are examples of areas where certainly standardisation uh, would help. Uh, everybody, not only the businesses, but also the regulators, and in the end, uh, the users, the consumers. <coughs> so I think we need to uh, consider all of those uh, aspects. Mm -hmm. And this is what we, the uh, uh, standardization is there for, to help businesses, to help consumers, to help everybody, because we need to take the into uh, account the interest of all stakeholders 
uh, and we need to help bring them all together. And this is what standards organizations do. Okay. This is what we do. Thank you. Before I come out to all of you, I just want to ask um, our panel a few more questions. And I want to pick up on that uh, issue there um, where both you and Thomas was underlining what happens when you don't have uh, what you need. And as you said, lack of standards. We heard earlier, uh, Christian used the word disaster. Um, and I want to come back to something I asked him. Um, if it is so self-evident, and, and many in our audience uh, share uh, the belief that standards are an important driver of innovation, a support of innovation, a stimulator. Why is it um, that there is an impression out there? What do you say to those, because maybe not in this room, but who say, it's, this isn't giving us competitive edge, this is a barrier to innovation, this is a burden. It's been referred to by our opening speakers. How do you convince them? Why is there that impression? If, if it is, to use that horrible Americanism, a no-brainer, uh, then why aren't more people seizing that advantage? Patrice, did you want to grab the mic? So please. Just to, to react on what yeah. question and our colleague said, you know, about SMEs and why it's important for SMEs. If you are an SME and you want to uh, develop some innovation to bring this innovation to the market, you have one key issue, of, co of course, is the financing of your innovation. Believe me, you will never get, never, you know, a financial support, you know, from a venture capital, capital from a business standard, from any financial investors, if you do not bring, bring the evidence that your standards will be acceptable to, uh, to, to buy the market, you know. Otherwise, you invest your money and, and you don't know how, you know, you, you will get a payback, pay of course. So it's absolutely necessary, you know, if you want to invest in an, in an innovation, to have an idea about how your products, you know, or your services will go to the market. Mm -hmm. The second thing was about what Christine said, you know, about services and process. It's absolutely necessary. You know, as EY, we are an auditing company, as you know, and we are as well, you know, uh, an advisory company with, I would say, that we are more or less process guys, you know. And uh, we know that, I would say, in this industrial world, as you said, and especially in the knowledge economy, if you do not have process, you know, and standards process, you know, it doesn't work, it doesn't work at all. And you can have a global you know, discussion or let's say relationship with key players, I would say with your partners, with your suppliers, with your clients, if you do not have standards you know, to mm. work with. Volker. Uh, that just reminds me I have to take over at this point. I'm, <laughs> on the one hand, I'm absolutely with you, but sometimes I, uh, I must admit that all of us, we are thinking in a linear process. Starting from the idea, starting from creativity, then have an innovation, then incubation and all these kind of stuff. And following what you were saying, I'm absolutely with you. We are process guys too. And we know that the world outside is not a linear process, but a very complex parallelization of these processes. And I must put the, the question, are we ready today to have forms of creativity into innovation, into standardization and patterns as a linear process? Or have we to form up new kinds of working together and, for example, taking into account the standardization potentials later on to convince, for example, credibility in a very early stage of the innovation processes? Okay, thank you. Torsten, you raised this issue of awareness. You said your studies show the benefit, but you also found a lack of awareness. Um, what can be done about that? And why, why this perception sometimes? Mm. Why does standards have a negative perception mm. when they are such an asset? Mm. Um, I mean, what can be done about it? The, the question is, how do we embrace better different communities? We were just touching, for example, the world of venture capitalism financing innovation. Yeah? If you have been with in, in a venture capitalist pitch yeah, and you have experienced that for a couple of times, then the first question is always of the venture capitalists to the, uh, to the startups, do you have patents? How do you protect your ownership? Right. The question is never, are you going to, are you going to create standards? Yeah? So <laughs> I think that still, although we obviously have in this room people who are aware of the benefits of standards, the majority out there of the innovation community and the innovation community really in a broader sense of capitalists, researchers, applied researchers, startups, they are indeed not aware of the instruments and they are not aware of the power of standards. Mm -hmm. So it's an, it's an awareness problem mm -hmm. and there are lots of exciting stories. Let me just put forward one. Yeah? We often say in innovation we know today that you know, the exciting innovation happens not by digging deeper 
in one field of technology necessarily, but it happens very often if you have different fields of technology coming together. Mm -hmm. So, for example, we, ex we have come across a lot, of a lot of examples which really show that that um, has a very exciting business potential. If you think of uh, a company in the automotive industry being busy with surface coatings, yeah, and what they really did, they started to consult existing standards in other industries, just looking at the standards. And by looking at these standards, they came to new, completely new ideas. And for example, they adapted part of their stuff in the pharmaceutical industry and could put forward innovation there. And nobody would have thought about an automotive company in the automotive sector doing something in the pharmaceutical sector. And the instrument, the channel, we are this, why are this happened, is really the channel of the existence of standards yeah. and the ability to participate in the process of the creation in these committees and so on. So these are important instruments, but, uh, but people will typically not think bef of that beforehand. Yeah. That's our so, so very crucial, really, as a platform there for disseminating research and results, as you say, across boundaries, uh, and for providing that this is the state of the art, this is what we know, uh, and perhaps that's a role that people don't always see uh, very clearly. They see them as something else. Um, Christine, I wanted to come back when you said, you know, I need to prove um, that that my job is worthwhile. When you, within your company, are helping people to innovate, um, do you find that they are already aware of the role that standards can play and need to play? Or do you have to do a selling job uh, to explain to them why uh, talking about this is indeed helping them to innovate? Uh, yes, uh, I have to make a selling job and to uh, prove that with uh, very precise methods, they uh, can help and bring added value for new creation. Can give you an example. Um, I suppose that everybody know uh, the car pulling website, Blah Blah Car. Mm. Yes, it's uh, implemented in 15 countries, and we have a partnership in France with Blah Blah Car because of a regulation at the beginning, which is what we call in French Certificat d'économie d'énergie, and we have created a standard about what is the energy saving implemented by carpooling. Mm. And for mm. us, it is a standard now. We have proved, we have made a study, we have uh, developed w a creativity workshop, and we have proved that now it is standard when you do carpooling, it saves, I don't remember the precise figure, uh, something of uh, eight liter, X liters of uh, fuels. And faced with this standard we have created, with the French government, we have created an uh, innovation process to help people to make coupling. Mm. So it's a process of innovation mm. and it helps people and we prove it. Thank you. Thomas, you talked about uh, the highly fragmented market and there, obviously, there are two types of standards. There are those that are driven and emanate from EU regulation and directives or national regulation and directives and those, the bulk of them, driven by industry uh, recognising the need uh, for a standard if one doesn't exist or to update it. But what for you um, is the key do you think that the drive needs to come more from the policy end for this awareness raising to get where you want to go? Where is going to be the driver uh, to get standards to play that role you think they need to play? Can I disagree with Thorsten You first? certainly can. <laughs> Panels are all about debate. Thorsten <laughs> said the venture capitalist will always ask for help. Do you have a patent? Yep. Well, I happen to also manage a five-year, 25 million euro uh, capi venture capital uh, fund, okay? or participate in it, and I must disagree, because what the investor is looking for is value. Uh, if, uh, I think it's a perception that this patent is value, and the patent can be absolutely valueless. What the investor <laughs> really wants is to know whether your product will go into the market. And if you have a good standard, you have a fantastic argument, okay, to, sh to demonstrate to your investor that it will go to the market. And coming back to mm -hmm. your question, um, I don't think it must be coming top down from the regulator, no. by all means, okay? The regulator has a role to play, 
must intervene, must help, must subsidize, must create an, an, an helping environment, if, if I may say so, mm -hmm. okay? At the very end, the regulator sets up regulations and, and jurisdiction, so that has to somehow also fit into this equation, but the standards have to come from the industry, yes. from the innovators, and from those applying the research mm. to solving new problems, mm. clearly. Mm. Absolutely. That is the core of why they work. We've heard from many people that consensus, that driven by need, uh, driven by, I think the word Christian used was real world. It has to be done. Gudrun, would you agree with that? Well, absolutely. Uh, all our work is based on market-driven standards. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, of course, uh, when I say market driven, of course, the regulators, the authorities are a part of that market. So some of the uh, needs, some of the requirements obviously come from them. Yeah. Uh, but uh, our, our work is market driven. It's, yeah. it's, uh, it's about the map. Uh, and uh, of course, standards can help uh, uh, people, can help businesses in implementing regulation or in, in fulfilling the requirements of regulation. Uh, but standards and are, are, are not really an uh, extension of, of, of the law. Right. They, they are tools, uh, they are business tools to help businesses to fulfill, uh, in, in some cases, to fulfill the requirements of, of the law. Absolutely. And you describe them as tools, going to this awareness question as well, and this perception. I mean, do, do standards have um, an image problem sometimes? Is it, it is, does there need to be, as I say, we seem to have a, an audience of people who believe in their role, um, but you do hear people say quite often uh, that they think they will be a, they're a barrier to in innovation. They don't understand this. Um, how, how can you get across that message? I mean, is it, as Patrice uh, and, and various people are suggesting, actually money talks, and you're not going to get any money for your innovation if you, if you don't use standards. What is the key to, to getting this wider awareness and therefore uh, you know, more and more companies exploiting standards? Well, this, this of course, is, the, is, is one of the problems that we in the standards uh, world are dealing with. That it's, it's, the, it's the image. Mm. And when I was uh, starting in standardization, I heard somebody describe uh, this in, in, in those terms. Some people make things happen, some people watch things happen, and some people wonder what happened. <laughs> and I think that those who really participate in standardization, they are those who make things happen. Yes. There are other people who are quite happy with using standards. They are watching things happen. And there are those who don't have a clue about standards. And they wonder what happened. <laughs> so we really need to try to get this message across. If you want to make things happen, you have to be involved. You have to be aware, at least be aware of the benefits of standards and how to use them. Okay, can I just, one more question, then I will come out to all of you, but about this, I like that, making things happen, watching things happen, or wondering what happened. That brings us to the question of the stage in the innovation cycle uh, and tending, and this goes back a little bit to the image question, uh, a tendency to think, oh, well, this is something I need to address later on. When I'm looking for a market application for my basic or applied research, now I'm ready to go, now, what do I need to do about standards? Um, how important is it for you know, this early stage so that you aren't one of those people who sees what happened or, or watches it? And if I can sort of just, just building on what we talked about about the image, have you any suggestions for making standards sexy? <laughs> Not something I thought I would say today, but it comes to me as I'm talking. How do we, how do we address this, this image question? Because as Gudrun said, for the standards world, one of the biggest challenges. So the stage in the innovation cycle, how would you convince people that at your stage, Volker, it's crucial and not just when it gets to Christine's stage, if I can put it very simply. So my stage is crucial. Yeah. You <laughs> so you, you want... <laughs> that's a good... <laughs> so, no, but, but you see, how to make standards sexy? Uh, I think... The most important thing is that people who use standards understand that it's not the boring standardization process, but it's the product at the end of the standardization process, which is the standard. And very often in our discussions, you find that people are talking about, oh, it's standard standardization and boring processes. And I think we must differentiate. Yes, for sure, a standardization process needs resources, you have to get in, you have to give in, you have to spend resources and time, that's for sure. And I know that all standardization bodies are trying to reduce these efforts. But it must be clear, and this is the sexy thing that you were addressing to, that the existing standard, the product at the end of the process, 
can use and can help companies and economies, economies to be more on a higher performance level. You can avoid resource spending. You can avoid reinventing the wheel. And how often do we find in small mediums exactly this situation? They are not aware about an existing standard that could help them mm. to avoid spending resources on reinventing the wheel. And I think this is a sexy thing. It's all about money. It's saving resources. It's saving money. Mm. And this message doesn't reach especially the small mediums. The small mediums, normally, they are only urging for patents. They are getting aggressive into the market. We are innovative. We are the innovators. And they don't think about how to avoid spent resources and to use these resources for innovation, creativity, and being more potential for the markets. Yeah. Um, Torsten, if I could ask you, because you, as I mentioned earlier, one of the things you specialize in is this knowledge transfer from science to the economy. I want to go back to our title, this bridging role, uh, which addresses that problem Europe talks about all the time. We're very good in research. We often lead in the patent area, uh, bringing those two issues together. We are not so good at getting the value out of our innovations. Um, how do you see, in terms of where standards come into play, why, do, why are they so important as part of that bridge? Okay, and the broader picture is actually that we see today that in, in the bridge between the world of research and the world of the companies, we see a lot of new forms and institutions being tried. You have technology transfer offices, you have intermediaries and so on and so on. So you have dozens of institutions developing and we haven't found really a good way, a really efficient way to, to do that bridge. Right. And standards can be a very important element in that. I mean, obviously they are most important for the market that has turned out for being on the market and they, they can introduce some sense of cooperation. Yeah? Cooperation also with the small ones, the small firms, and so, and so on. And if you really want to, let's say, make that chain from research to company world better, you have to think of more alignment. I mean, uh, people in the companies are often complaining, researchers don't do what we want them to do, they don't concentrate on the relevant business research. How do we get that alignment? And standards have to be part in that alignment and can be a very important element in, in shaping and creating that alignment in the right. system. Okay. Yeah? So and just, a small mm. element would be, for example, how do we get a researcher in that? Yeah? Mm. I mean, the researcher, usually if you have a new professor being appointed at an institution or uh, or at the university, you don't ask him, have you been uh, part of a creation, of a cre norm creation process? But usually, <laughs> if the, in the engineering world, they always would say, I have one patent, two patents, and so on. So, so we need, a, in, with alignment, I mean, that we rethink also these elements. Okay. And it's interesting because Volker said that it's the product of this process, but actually the process itself uh, that creation of cooperation of the networks and so on um, is a very valuable part of the whole thing for the benefits that come, not just from the knowledge sharing, but the understanding, the relationship with other stakeholders in the area you're working. That is also a key part. Patrice, a thought on oh, that? To me, you are touching down now, the, let's say, the key element of the discussion. Because, I mean, to me, what is interesting in, the, in that discussion is there is no difference of consideration between the different providers around this table, researchers, industry, let's say, regulator, operator. Everybody, I mean, is exactly on the same line. And the, there is, a, let's say, a strong commitment or willingness, you know, to, let's say, to develop standards, whatever you are, whoever you are at innovation level or at market level. So to me, there is no question mark. Now, what the key point is really, as we say, you know, now standardization is considered, the process is considered as a very boring process. It's not the nice, b nice blonde, sexy you are describing, you know, <laughs> as beginning. But no, but to, to me, if we want, I would say to, let's say, to make people more willing, you know, to use the standardization process, first of all, we need to, we must turn something which is considered, you know, as, let's say, a constraint, an admin burden, an obligation, which is not at all an obligation, as we know, but into something which is really a driver for 
your success, you know. Mm -hmm. And based on that, you know, and this is true, is it's not easy if you want to have a, to, to, to define a standard, you know. And I like the, the idea of a disruptive, you know, approach, not not only, you know, a line a line linear, mm -hmm. you know, approach, but a disruptive approach and maybe some researchers, even without let's say working on a product, you know, think about standards and how you can uh, con to develop a concept of products based on new standards. This is, this, is, well, this is something which is interesting in terms of uh, cr creativity. But to me, I mean, Sen and Senelec, because you are the organizer of this day, you know, Sen and Senelec, I would say, could do a lot, you know, to make easier, you know, and faster, you know, this admin process, you know, to bring this standard, you know, this new standard, or to support, let's say, European players, you know, to develop this standardization process. Okay. This is absolutely crucial. Okay, I want to come back on that speed issue a little bit later, if I might, but just staying for a moment, Tomas, I know you wanted to come in and Volker, and perhaps if you can explain when we come to you, um, if you move away from the linear process, what would it actually mean? But Thomas, you wanted to come in first. Yeah, how we make standards sexy. Um, just like we do, <laughs> just, I like this question, so, uh, <laughs> just like we do with a movie star, by marketing, okay? And uh, congratulations to the organizers. This meeting today here, in my view, is very sexy, okay? <laughs> so, if we, <laughs> if we accept that standards are the consensus of what the best looks like, yeah. who wouldn't go for the best? Everybody, right? So, the problem of this phrase is the word consensus. And while we have in Europe a long history of creating a lot of consensus, and Europe is actually a big consensus, we also are still lacking an awful lot of consensus and pragmatism, okay? And this is what we have to work on. Uh, the idea is that standards are needed from the very conception of the idea. They go all the way to the marketing and introduction into the market and the maturity phase when you actually conquer the market. So they have to be everywhere and all stakeholders need to be involved. And I guess the key message can only be consensus, consensus. Okay. And consensus is not imposition of the best. Consensus is getting everybody together and agree on something which is practical, agreeable, and reasonable. Okay. Volker, just on this linear versus a more disruptive process. Yeah, I'm not directly on linear. But uh, you know, now I'm on the, on the selling side on research. I have to sell to you why research plays an important role in this area. And yeah. you know, the standard time for a professor is 90 minutes of a lecture. So please, I start <laughs> right now. <laughs> See, to my mind, what is the standard at the end, the product? It's a consensus. It's a common understanding. It's a consensus. And that means, in respect to a patent, that a group of an application field of a branch has committed to consensus. And the consensus means we have find a mutual understanding at a certain level. And there are three questions that normally are per definition to be treated by researchers. First is a researcher has to provide a neutral position. A researcher never is going for a branch or for a, uh, entering a branch or for, for commercialization. He has to point out a neutral position. For, second one is a researcher has to provide a certain kind of, um, how to call it, generic approach. A generic approach. If we are doing research, we are asked to have a generic approach, which is more or less on a certain level and not directly used for industrial purposes. Mm. Second part is, and this is exactly lining in for the linear approach, the researcher should not do research because he is a researcher. This is research for libraries that we have been doing the last centuries. A researcher should do research for industries. That means if he has understood what is a relevant topic in industry, if he is deeply involved in this, he could be able to help in the last stage of finding a standard, which is the maturity. Yeah. We have been just tackling to maturity. Uh, patents are proved by patent bodies, and a patent is proved in terms of the feasibility and all this kind of. Who is proving the maturity of a standard? Who is the one saying this is a high maturity? This could be done by researchers. Researchers are working on use cases, demonstrators, digital test beds. Yeah. And while not using this as defining a certain maturity, helping in a very early process stage 
to get at the end quicker to a standard as a product. Thank you. Christine, if I could ask you, I'm just going to get a thought from Christine and Gudrun and then I'm coming out to all of you. But on this role of, of making the link between researchers, not within the company, but the researchers outside the company and industry, um, and this consensus approach that we're talking about, that mutual understanding and so on, how important do you think this is as, as part of the process of making a company like yours able to take the basic research that's done and, and turn it into value into products. How important a role do standards play there? Uh, I, I agree with you because uh, standards for me, maybe you can change the name. Okay, what do you want to call sexy, them? <laughs> toolbox. Toolbox. Methods. For me, it's the same thing. And also uh, for research, that uh, we have to prove that standards can, can help people to go quickly to the market. Yeah. For me, it's in evidence. And to... Um, also to learn to research. Researchers that they are working for the market and not for the research. Mm. And uh, try to help them with standards to uh, use more uh, profitable tools about uh, how to address the market. Yeah. How can I transform my <coughs> research in something uh, very useful mm. for uh, the market and mm. for the customers? Mm. Because I never hear the word customer, but innovation for me is an ID mm. who finds a market and finds a customer. Mm. For me, it's a, maybe the, st the, the first standard of innovation is to define innovation. Mm. And for an, innov an idea to find a market, you need the standard. <laughs> so we come back to Gudrun, this, this, this point in terms of, of this bridge, I just want to focus on this bridging question. Come back to speed later on if we might. Um, but on this, this role as the bridge, would you agree with what you have heard? Um, and, and in terms of the branding, is it better to call it a tool? You talked about it being a tool right at the beginning. Um, is that the sort of way we need to frame this? And then I'm coming out to all of you. Well, yes. Uh, for some people, uh, the, the word standard it's in itself has some negative connotations. It, uh, it has been, and I would like to come back to the speed issue later. Absolutely, but we will do, being, I promise. It is being seen as a, a, a slow uh, process. And, uh, but w what we are trying to do is to uh, promote standards as tools uh, that will help you uh, Make it or improving your performance rather than being restrictive, yes. uh, they are they are enabling you mm. uh, to to better conduct your business. Yeah. They are what well, you can call them tools. You can call them um, methods or or whatever if you don't like the word standard. But in the end, it is the consensus about how to go, do, do things, things. In, in, the, in the best way, in the most practical way. Mm. So that key word that Scott used at the beginning, the enabler word, for yes, you is, yes, is the core word. Okay, let's go out. We will, I promise, I want to come back, not you know, on how this question of how standards in a world where innovation cycles get shorter and shorter, uh, and in a world uh, where you know, the technology just moves so fast, how do standards cope with that? But we'll come back on that. Let's see if there are any questions or comments. Ben, is there anything coming in from the Twitter sphere uh, at the moment? Here we are. Well, yes, I have one question from um, a, a participant here, Pier Giuseppe Cassone from Confindustria Bergamo, who was interested uh, in the uh, possibility of standardizing the innovation process itself. And um, <laughs> some people might know that. Uh, SEN published a technical specification last year on innovation management systems. And um, do the panel think that uh, standards can help SMEs to manage innovation in a more structured way? Hmm. Thank you very much. A very interesting question. Hang on, I'm seeing lots of questions here. Um, the difficulty with somebody right in the middle is that in this room, it is almost impossible to reach you. So what I'm going to ask is a little bit, of, we talked about cooperation. Could I have your cooperation, please, to get the mic to the gentleman in the middle? Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Um, Professor Linson from the MNR Senior Poll Network. Um, well, regarding, I, I'm wondering what's going to be, what should be the final stage of innovation? What's the finality of innovation? What is innovation for? 
Is it to develop new technology? Well, fine, if it benefits the citizens' well-being, quality of life. If not, what's the point? Um, I mean, the number of research projects, PhD thesis, action plans, roadmaps, grids, organizations, institutions worldwide is truly astounding. It's very impressive. What is less impressive is that we have made a thorough mess of this world and that no one knows what to do. Okay, that's quite a broad issue for a conference on, on standards, but your point is taken, uh, innovation for a purpose. There was one over there, if you could pass it to the lady. Yeah, she's got the mic there. And if you could give, no, 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 sorry. No, no, there's a mic there for you and that one back to me. Sorry, it's a bit complicated with this rather difficult room to manage. Please, madam, sorry. Uh, I'm Eva Giesen from the National Institutes of Health in Paris, or France. And I would first like to act up against the vision that researchers have to learn that they uh, do research for the market, for the industry. Because there are some research researchers who are not supposed to work for the market and the industry, but who create knowledge. And I think this is an important point to... Thank the you. The second thing is uh, that researchers of whatever horizon and of whatever background uh, can profit from standards. And I would like to point out a, a standard that the French uh, standardization body AFNO has uh, put out in July of this year, so this is a very new standard, uh, NFX 5553, which is about how do I manage research activities in uh, an efficient and in an ethical way. Okay. Mm. This Thanks. stat may be of interest, uh, like the one on innovation. Thank you very follow. much indeed, and, and there, thank you, and pointing out uh, that question about basic research being so important, it's not all necessarily at the outset driven, so question perhaps there, uh, do standards have a role when we come to basic research, or is it only really once you start to get to the applied research that they begin to be really important? We'll come back on that. Any other questions or indeed comments? to what you've heard before I come back to the panel. Right in the middle again. I'm not, I really don't know how we're going to reach you. Um, could people on the edges of the rows ask some questions? <laughs> no, if we could just pass along the line. Lady, can you wave your hand again so she can see you? Right, and if, you could, I, if I could ask you just to pass it along the line to the blonde lady in the middle. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Louise Burgoyne. I'm from University College Cork in Ireland. And my question is on education. So a lot of our students leaving university may have little or no knowledge of standards. And so I'd just like to ask the panel what their view is on standards education in young people, say, before they go into the workplace. Thank, Thank you. you so much. you can't have the awareness if people have no education or training in standards, what they are and how to use them. Any other comments or questions before we come back? I see, yes. Oh, can't leave you out, sir. Uh, Tore Trondvall, I'm the president of Senelec, and um, I would uh, like to um, correct a um, uh, misperception that was presented by um, Patrice um, from Ernst & Young. Uh, he said that standardization is a boring process. <laughs> I would say that uh, having participated in standardizations in many years, I can guarantee you it's not boring at all. <laughs> you could consider it as, uh, as a battle or a fight. <laughs> and and the, um, the way to reach consensus is not boring at all. And um, when um, it comes to why participate, I would say that even coming from a big European uh, um, multinational, I would say that we do not know everything. There are also others that know a lot. And when you are sitting in a committee, you contribute with your part, but the nine others in the committee also contribute with your part. And it's a very good deal to give one piece of information and receive nine pieces of information. And, f <laughs> and finally, the question about speed. Yes, in some parts, yeah. speed is very important, but over industry in the electrotechnical sector that I know the best, they say, 
in the choice, if necessary, between quality and speed, we prefer quality. Thank you very much indeed. Now, I don't think Patrice was saying he thought it was not sexy. I think he was saying we were talking about how to overcome the perception, but I'm very happy for you two to put the gloves on afterwards and I'll referee the boxing match. Okay, lots of issues coming up, so let's come back. And panel, if I can ask you, please don't feel you all need to pick up on every point, but really what is most relevant? Who would like to? Gudrun, do you want to come in? And on this speed question, let's tackle it yes. head on. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. I would like to thank Tori also for bringing this up. This was exactly going to be one of my... <laughs> My issue is that we have to always to balance uh, speed and, and quality. Uh, in our uh, standardization world, we work, uh, we have certain principles. We have the principles of openness and transparency. We involve all types of stakeholders, so we are inclusive. Uh, and as has been said before, consensus, consensus, consensus. Mm -hmm. This is uh, really the core of our, our work. And consensus, unfortunately, sometimes takes time. Mm. If we did not need to reach consensus, uh, we would be much quicker. Um, anyhow... Um, I believe already, I think since 2006, the average time to agree a standard has been halved, and it was five well, years, and it's now two and a half. Can, well, we get, can it get even faster? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, can, we have uh, cases where we have developed European standards with full consensus under one year. Right. So we have cases of that, and we are getting uh, uh, better, we are getting quicker, we are um, improving our procedures, we are uh, and still keeping in mind and, and keeping uh, as our principles the transparency, inclusiveness, and so on. But then we also have uh, another uh, kind of uh, deliverable, another kind of tool, which we call the workshop agreements, and they can be uh, even faster, but they have limited consensus. They're not European-wide consensus uh, documents, or, or, but they are still quite useful tools. They can, and they are uh, used uh, very much in the uh, area of research to mm. uh, help get research, uh, or results of research projects quicker to the market. Just on this question of speed, there is also a study which is summarized in people's conference packs talking about um, one issue they raise is the speed of transferring new knowledge into standards. So not how long it takes to get one, but are we in this fast-moving world of technological change? Is that transfer of knowledge happening quickly enough? And if it isn't, how can we speed it up? General thoughts on the speed question and that if anyone can help us with it. Volker, did you want to come in? Yeah. I would like to take over the, the first battle on this because I think uh, what Mr. Postle said is very crucial to this. The speed does not help us if we have a very deep diving basic research. And this is exactly for the young lady in the, in the uh, latest mm -hmm. row there. When I was talking about research and the integration of research, I was talking about the combination of the knowledge, exactly what Mr. Postle was talking about, the combination between basic research and integrating basic research results into applied research. And applied research, this is a connector to the research activities of companies. And as we know, small mediums, they don't have big research possibilities. So researchers, applied researchers, can take over this role and could be used as an outsourced resource to help and to speed up these processes. That was my, my concern. I'm absolutely not against basic research, that's for sure. But how to speed up means integration. And companies of today in a knowledge-driven area, they are not interested in single solutions. We find very often companies are interested in integrated solutions. Yeah. And this is why, for example, that's my background. We have been dealing a lot in research in technical services. Technical services is not tangible. And we have been doing a lot amount of projects with the German Dean mm. to describe technical services. You can't touch to it. And there we had a very proven concept which was the past, the public available specification. Public available specification, very quick, very adaptive, and very easy to use. And that's, to my mind, these are, you, Gudrun has been talking about tools. We need innovative tools to raise down the barriers and to make the players in this field to play together. Mm. Mm. Torsten. Yeah, I'd like to add on this. I think that's a very important message. And I also would say we have actually in the countries and in Europe, we have very good research system, which really is basic research. Then the next stage is applied research. Then we have industrial research. And very often these are really 
different spheres. And certainly the question, where can you use standards, may be very differently answered in different uh, industries. So it's not obvious, you cannot just say, okay, if you are in basic research, don't care about standards. I wouldn't support that. You rather have to look into where is the point, what, what, will, what kind of value will create that in the end. And indeed, we are living in an age where we, have, where we will hear the question more often, what did you use our public money for? <laughs> so any researcher has to be aware of that question because research is living from public money. So we have to create some sense in that. Mm. And in that respect, standards, again, can be an element of, and, and can be, you can always have a look as a researcher, can we use that? Mm. And maybe I can just open Please another do. dimension yeah. to this, uh, because somebody touched the idea of innovation and is innovate. It sounded to me a bit like is innovation just uh, about business and business yeah. models yeah. and so on, earning money, to put it straight. Yes, it is just about earning money, and we are living in a market economy, and we have indeed produced a lot of global challenges where we where we look at our children and say, okay, what's going to happen on that planet? Uh, so. It's not so, not so easy anymore. But on the other hand, yeah, we are doing, for example, as Europe, think of the 80 billion we are spending in the Horizon program and all of that. Is, and all of that is devoted to these uh, global or societal and global challenges. And many of our national governments have, in fact, aligned their programs with that. So one thing, yes, we have to earn money, because I also want to live as a European in a privileged world in 20, 30 years. And to the extent we can do it in the public sector, we are using okay. money really to, to, to cope with these challenges. And again, it, it, we heard at the beginning, smart cities, green construction or whatever. Um, standards have a major role in that. Could you just say one word as well, just picking up on this point about the question about SMEs, because you talked about SMEs earlier, and this question of whether standards can help innovation management systems. Uh, can standards themselves help smaller companies uh, to innovate and manage their innovation more effectively? I could imagine that, clearly, yeah. The point is the, um, that I mean, uh, what we found in the, in the uh, result is that companies learn the most when they are involved in these committees and actually in the seemingly standardization process, seemingly boring or not boring standardization <laughs> process. Yeah? But what we found is really that's a learning process. And it's a learning yeah. process for cooperation. And actually, there are scientific studies out there which show that in some countries, cooperation works better than in other countries in the, in the company world. And so there would be a function even here to, to train cooperation. We live in an age of cooptition. We have this word yeah. cooptition. You need to be able to compete on the one hand mm -hmm. and to see, okay, here's a chance, here's an opportunity for mm -hmm. cooperation at the same time. So you have to play both always. Okay. And, and yeah. their standards are a wonderful instrument Hang to on. foster that. Hang on. I know you want to come in, Volga, if it's very short, because I want to give the others a chance to respond. Is it a very quick one? Very quick one, very quick one. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy that you were pronouncing this very clearly, but I have to admit, when you're looking to Horizon 2020, we have found about 12 activities where these activities are going for standards at the end. And I might put the question, I like it very much what Gudrun was talking about. Yeah. Do we have the right tools, toolboxes, mm. to answer to innovation, speed, and accessibility to market? Or do we have to get some innovation ideas on other forms of tools, like qualification, like digital bed test beds, like demonstrators? Okay. Perhaps we should yeah. think about this. So when, when, when people in the audience are answering the question of the panel, can standards answer your innovation challenges? And yes, but it's not a silver bullet. You're really very much echoing that. Um, a thought, please, on what you, any question you like, but particularly, can we just turn, because we don't have long, to that education question. You mentioned training. Uh, Patrick is grabbing his mic. He obviously feels passionately about this one. We need to raise awareness of standards at a very young level. Otherwise, they don't see the point when you talk to them, Christine, or 
please, Patrice first, and then Thomas and Christine. No, to me, to me, it was this question about education, because education, uh, and, you know, at the end of the day, it's the earlier stage, you know, we can bring, you know, the standardization, you know, uh, let's say mindset, you know, and to integrate it, you know, at the, so uh, to, to people. So to me, I would say, that, and this is probably, uh, I would say, the way that Sensena, like, you know, can, you know, start, you know, to spread out this culture of standardization, uh, let's say, in a nice uh, and sexy way. And, and, and based on that, I would say that, that there is a fantastic instrument, you know, at, at European level, which call, you know, uh, European Institute of Technology with the kicks, you know. And it's really, I would say, this, let's say, bridge, you know, between higher education, innovation, research, and the market itself, meaning industry, you know. And probably if we can help people, you know, young people, you know, uh, to, to, let's say, to get access, you know, and to understand why and how, you know, standardization, you know, standards, you know, can help, you know, to spark, to accelerate, you know, research and innovation and to bring, to bring it to the market, probably when they will, be, they will be managing labs or, let's say, companies as future manager, they will fully, you know, you know, integrate this dimension, which is absolutely strategic. Thank you. So not only early in the innovation cycle, but early in the life cycle in order to get the innovators of the future to use it. Thomas, a thought on that, and Christine. Uh, a thought about culture. If you think yeah. about it, this is all about culture. And this picks up on the educational issue. If we close the eyes and we think about who is innovating the most in the world, we probably think about Asia and the United States. We don't think about Europe. Talking about innovation. Yes, I agree, innovation is about getting to the market. The market you can interpret a little bit broader if you want and define it as making a better world also, okay? But it's about getting to the market. So this cultural issue, we should ask ourselves the questions, which are the differences yeah. between those cultures which are today more innovative and ours? And that culture changes what I think we should foster. Okay. Culture yeah. and mindset as well. I mean, it is about changing mindsets, Christy. Culture, of course, yes, yes, it's a question of, of uh, essential for innovation. Another point I want to, to, to focus also is that I agree with all of you, innovation is to earn money, but innovation is also everywhere in a company. So uh, people have to innovate everywhere. So mm -hmm. they have to learn, they have to be trained to innovate and to use standards and to define methods. Another point uh, I want to also to focus on is also that we need standards. It's not a question of only a question of speed, but also a question of matter. So there are some topics about innovation. We need to have standards. For example, open innovation, collaboration, and IP. Because in our cases, we need to collaborate with other companies, and IP is not very adapted to this type of collaboration. So I think we don't need rules, but we need standards. Mm -hmm. And we work in my company to establish some rules, some standards, some tools to try to define how to work with other partners in uh, legal rules, in legal, on legal level, don't know the word. Okay, thank you. And that's innovation everywhere. And one thing we haven't talked about so much is uh, actually the, the switch, if you like, from the focus being on products to now, of course, services, an absolutely key area. We heard about it earlier in terms of health care as well as health products. So the range of things where standards are applicable and are needed and are useful is widening all the time. I want to put our panel on the spot in a minute uh, and just try and draw some conclusions from this session for you to take into the breakouts. But before I do that, are there any burning questions or comments uh, to what you have heard? Is there anything? Yes, and thank you, a lady on the end of a row. How kind. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> uh, Beatrice Morier, Total. I just want yeah. to um, insist on the fact uh, that uh, we are at the present time working on the uh, standardization for the management uh, of innovation. And it's France that leads uh, this new TC279 with uh, Alice de Casanova, Airbus Industry. Uh, so we are working with uh, many countries worldwide to try to define what innovation is mm. and to uh, uh, standardize uh, the 
management of innovation and the process for innovation. Thank you. Thank you very much for that indeed. Ben, anything more coming in from Twitter at the moment or is it more just comments on, on what we've heard? Anything to add at this point? Yeah? A couple of questions. Uh, one from Sean Lyons. If standards are about alignment and a consensus of good, how do we prevent bias during their creation? And one from Peter Beckett, who asks, when an innovation has come to market without specific standards, how can we retrofit them? Retrofitting standards. Uh, anybody a quick thought on, on either of those before we draw conclusions? Or is this something, maybe questions that we'll need to delve into as well in our breakout sessions? Anybody able to respond uh, at all in terms of, of, of the alignment? You know, is there, presumably it's the consensus that avoids the bias. Isn't it? Isn't that how you, Gudrun? Would that would that be the answer there? Well, I I think I think uh, the definition of consensus uh, really uh, excludes bias. Mm. Uh, the way we work, we try to uh, include the, uh, all kinds of all types of stakeholders, and all our draft standards are subject to national inquiries in every okay. uh, member country. So that's what fixes so, it. Yeah. Thank you. I and retrofitting. I, ju uh, retro I just <laughs> wanted to say okay. that, I mean, the creation of standards is a transparent process. What else in the yeah. world of the economies is a trans in the world of the companies is a transparent process? So there's an opportunity basically for everybody to participate. So in that sense, it's a very democratic tool, okay. instrument. Okay. I think retrofitting we'll leave to one side for discussing later, but we only have a few minutes left before I introduce our next speaker. Um, we're going to hear a European policy perspective, but before we do that, and I'll start, if I might, this time with Gudrun and work the other way down. Gudrun, if you wanted to, same question I asked Christian in the first session, if you were talking to an innovator, someone in this room who hasn't yet worked with standards, got involved in the process, and you wanted to give them one piece of advice, but how to take advantage of all these benefits uh, and deal and address this issue and get really engaged, where would you advise them to start? What's your key piece of advice? You have just under a minute each, if you would. Yes, <laughs> I would uh, definitely advise them to uh, find out who are their national standards body and get in touch with them because they will have some information on, on how they can get involved. Or uh, also there's a lot of information available with uh, Sen and Senelec. So the first thing to do is to get informed, mm. to, to find the information, and to find the ways that, you can, that will best suit you. Okay. So there is state-of-the-art knowledge on how to get involved as much as anything else. Thomas, your piece of advice. Dear innovator, standards, <laughs> standards are the recognized and accepted frame within which your innovation will take place. So know the frame and challenge it then benchmark your innovation against that frame, and then when you develop your innovation, alone or with others, look for the new future frame for the new standard. Thank you very much indeed. Christine. Uh, just an advice is maybe to work at the beginning of the process of innovation. The most important thing mm. is to work on the question you want to answer. If you don't define the question at the beginning, you won't innovate. It's a essential to start innovation. Okay. okay, I have actually two pieces of advice. <laughs> Knowing now that Tom, Toma, Thomas is running a venture fund which really looks deeply into standards, I advise the innovator to consult Thomas <laughs> and <laughs> maybe to even invest the money there. And the second advice really is, I mean, I'm fascinated really by the new business models which are popping up all over the place. Yeah? So the interrelationship between looking at sta standards and the creation of standards on the one side and new business models at the other side has not at all been sufficiently explored. So for the innovators, that would be a primary task. And if you cannot do that alone, then go to applied researchers for technology and also for advising and reflecting business models. Thank you very much. Volker. Take into account that we are now have entered the information society and be aware that we are more and more getting into non-tangible products mm. which we sell on the market, which will raise up to completely new business 
in a very high speed and we will take businesses that we are not aware of in the next morning. Standards can help to raise effectiveness, cost effectiveness and therefore competitiveness. Thank you very much. Patrice, you have the last word. Oh, very yeah. short. Uh, <laughs> just do it. Just do it, please. Stop talking, just do it, and do it in a smart way. Smart way meaning, as we said, playing collective, not alone. Do it with the sand because they are very knowledgeable and they can help. Sand, sorry. And they can do a lot because they, have, they, are, they are, first of all, the key, let's say, advisor and supporter, you know, to, to, to develop this, this, uh, this action. And, and, uh, and, and uh, probably think about, you know, um, how you can, uh, you can use this tender again, you know, has a, a real added value for your uh, own activity, but let's say for the full process you are taking part of, as you said, it's, you know, a nature fantastic, you know, driver. It's a fantastic, you know, market driver, but it's, a so, it's as well, you know, a fantastic society driver. So more or less, do it. And on that note, thank you. That was the perfect note to end. Ladies and gentlemen, will you join me in thanking our panel very much indeed. Thank you. Please do return to the comfy seats. Um, I think you will agree, ladies and gentlemen, that they have provided us with a lot of food for thought, a lot of inspiration, and a lot of questions as well as answers uh, to be explored in more depth uh, during this afternoon breakout session. So um, thank you so much. Uh, that was thoroughly enjoyable as well as fascinating. And we have a new challenge, how to make standards sexy.